So I started with my inner circle. You know, I started negotiating probably a couple years ago and I really started to create like my process and like have a whole program on how I do that. But I started with my inner circle and my challenge was I want to make sure that they are getting equitable pay. So it really started with just helping my friends from there realizing this is something that you read about it. 60% of women do not negotiate their salary ever. Do you see the pay gap and how it affects different groups of people, especially Latinas and Black Indigenous women? When you put those two things together, I started realizing that there is a whole community that is not served, who is not going after this money. And we're leaving money on the table because a lot of us just don't know. You're listening to Yo Quiero Dinero, a personal finance podcast for the modern Latina. I'm your host, Janice Torres Rodriguez, personal finance expert, speaker, writer, and business coach. I teach women of color how to build wealth and gain financial independence through side hustles and investing. On this show, we're serving up POC-friendly personal finance knowledge, always with a side of sass. We're talking about how to make dinero, how to keep it, and how to make it grow. If you're ready to become poderosa with your dinero, you've come to the right place. Hola, mi gente. Welcome back to Yo Quiero Dinero, the podcast. This is your host, Janice, and you're listening to episode 125. How to Negotiate Your Salary with Salary Negotiation Queen, Evie Prete. Evie is a first-gen Latina engineer, speaker, and entrepreneur who's helping people tap into their inner dopeness. She's super passionate about working with people who desire to break generational curses, and she teaches women, BIPOC, and LGBTQ individuals how to advocate for themselves in salary negotiations. Evie is a former rocket engineer who worked on building suborbital launch vehicles, y'all. In 2021, she made the unplanned decision to leave her comfortable six-figure career to reevaluate her career path. In doing so, she launched a successful Latina fightwear e-commerce business and a salary negotiation group coaching program. As a new graduate out of college, Evie took her first job without negotiating because she didn't know any better. Within the first year, she discovered that she was being drastically underpaid and started her journey on salary negotiations. In the past five years, she's more than doubled her salary and has helped her clients negotiate five-figure increases in base salary, along with other additional perks. Evie believes that when women make bank, they make the world a better place, and she's on a mission to close the pay gap one client at a time. I know on this podcast, we talk a lot about entrepreneurship, but let's be honest, y'all. Most of us are going to start our careers off in corporate America. I had a 14-year career in corporate America before I decided to go rogue, and I know how important it is for us to advocate as women and especially people of color for equal pay. We know the statistics and honestly, they devastate me every single time I see them, but Latinas are earning on average 55 cents for every dollar that a white man earns. And so if we're going to close the pay gap, not only do we have to invest and start businesses, but we have to advocate for ourselves in the workplace. And that starts with advocating for your salary, making sure that you get paid what you deserve is your right. So if getting a salary increase is on your 2022 vision board, you don't want to miss this conversation. Stay tuned. Before we hop into today's conversation, I want to remind you to follow us on social. If you're loving this podcast and you want more community, you want to find out more about our events and all the stuff that we have going on behind the scenes, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, TikTok, YouTube, Instagram, and everywhere else you love to hang out on the internet. If you're loving this podcast, please take a moment to leave us a review if you listen to us on Apple. It's the easiest way to share our podcast with people that you know and love, and it helps us get discovered by amazing listeners like you. So take a moment, leave us a review, share us with your friends and family, subscribe so that you never miss an episode, and make sure to check out our blog, YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com, where you can sign up for our email list and you'll never miss an episode. Plus, you get exclusive invitations to our live events, special discounts for our digital courses, and as always, our best personal finance tips and advice to help you be poderosa with your dinero. Thanks for listening. Now, let's get into the episode. Evie, I am so excited to have you here on the podcast. Thank you for being here. No, thank you so much. I'm very excited. I've been listening to your podcast since I found it in 2019. And I literally put you on my vision board early 2020. So this is literally like full circle. So I'm so excited (laughs) to get into this. 
Oh my God, that's amazing. And for folks who don't know, Evie was part of my inaugural class of the Ultimate Side Hustle Starter Kit. So like to see you where you are now versus how I met you all shy, all trying to figure out your life. I am so excited to watch you grow and I can't wait for folks to meet you, to get to know you. So let's start off with you kind of doing an introduction. Sure. Uh, my name is Evie Brete, and I am a salary negotiation coach. And to give some context, I actually was thinking about a blog back in 2019, 2020, and I had really no idea what I was trying to do, what my niche was. I was kind of all over the place. And I remember booking Janice for like like a 30-minute conversation back when it was like $60. <laughs> So it's been amazing to see you grow as well. Had the opportunity to be in her first side hustle moguls class. And at the time I was a mechanical engineer. I studied at UC Davis and I was in a career in uh, space exploration, building suborbital vehicles, which was, you know, dope and cool. And But I was definitely knew there was something more. And that's why I kind of joined Janice's side hustle class and it really helped me give me the blueprint for, you know, launching two businesses, which I, you know, about to do last year. But as Jenny said, I was like shy. I was hiding behind my logo and just graphics. I wasn't going on lives. I wasn't showing my face. So last year, I really, you know, started to challenge myself in like showing up online, being vulnerable, sharing my story. And, you know, I focused naturally on salary negotiations because that's somewhere where I struggled starting off. Just complete transparency. I did not negotiate my first salary. In matter of fact, I felt like I was lucky to have this job. So I'm excited to share more about like my story, my passion for this, and kind of just how it all got started. I think we also connected on the fact that like we're both Latina engineers. It's very white male oriented environment and it can feel like what the hell are we doing here like somebody's gonna find out we're frauds I don't know why anybody gave me this job I felt like I couldn't be myself in my career and I'm wondering if you've had those same experiences absolutely it was I almost actually gave up on engineering in my first career because it was such a toxic environment I didn't know because it was my first job and I struggled I really struggled and it took me a couple you know other really nurturing companies to realize, wow, like I'm actually really good at this when I'm given agency, when, you know, people listen to my ideas. So it was definitely a struggle. And I definitely felt like I couldn't really be myself because myself meant like all of me, like a lot of me, all mm-hmm. the different parts that like, you know, and I realized like that's my superpower. That is mm-hmm. our superpower, right? Being ourselves and being able to empower and help others and help them with their ideas and essentially being good leaders, you yeah. know? Absolutely. So So I'm curious what inspired you to take the route of becoming an engineer. So for me, it was my dad. Like I was always good in science. I was always good at like just I was always a very naturally curious kid. And so I definitely took after him in that respect. And, you know, I think as people of color, like we're told you have three options. You're like either going to be a doctor, an attorney or an engineer. So pick which one you think you're going to be good at and do that. So what was the journey like for you? Yeah, it was very similar as well. I just knew like my mom would say like, you should be una doctora or like a (laughs) lawyer. And I found out very early that I'm not meant for, I'm not cut out for the medical field. And I'm glad (laughs) I found that out early, but I didn't even know what an engineer was until teacher kind of suggested it. And I would happen to be good at math and science. And again, also very curious too. Like one of my favorite stories that my dad used to tell was when I was little, I was like five, I was out in the front yard with him. And he was just watching me like play and I grab a rock and I threw it as hard as I could. And and it went through the kitchen window and I broke the window and he just looked at me kind of like, not even mad, more of like Evie, like, why would you do that? (laughs) And my response was like, I just wanted to see how far it would go. Mm. You know, that like natural curiosity of like really playing with like gravity and momentum and forces and just always just being really curious about it. So I applied to many different schools, but I went to UC Davis and studied mechanical engineering where I really started to really enjoy like thermodynamics and fluid dynamics and all the different heat transfer was one of my favorites, right? So I was just naturally very curious and really enjoyed understanding like the different like calculated systems and understanding how things worked. 
which is kind of how I feel like entrepreneurship is very similar, where you're like mm. trying to understand the different systems and ecosystems and how they work together and just being naturally curious about, especially the back end systems. That's like my favorite part of the business because it's kind of like just easier for me to manage. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. And so you were able to make it to NASA, which is just like mind blowing as an achievement for anybody. But I think especially for like Latinas, we just don't see that. So most people would be like, girl, you made it like there's nowhere but yeah, like you've made it to the top. So how did you start to discover that maybe this is just not what you wanted to do with the rest of your life? Yeah. So I actually worked for a company named Blue Origin. So very similar, like working on rockets and suborbital vehicles. And like, I remember telling my mom, like what I did. And my mom's like, oh, entonces NASA, verdad? And I'm like, sure, NASA. Because like, you know, it's just hard to run understand like new companies like SpaceX and all these cool companies out there. But I think for me, it was, you know, recognizing that you can be good at something. You can be really good at something. But if it doesn't really like light you up, you know, if you're not excited about it, it's kind of a waste of time. And for me, I got this really cool job and I was, you know, doing my dream, which is like a rocket engineer, right? And especially during COVID, COVID really put things in perspective for me. And I really started to question like, what impact am I actually making? You know, and as an engineer, like part of it was also wanting to like help people And when I thought about what I was doing, I was like, I'm helping rich white dudes take a luxurious 10 minute joyride to space. Like, is this really the impact that I want to make? And I really started questioning myself from there. And I, you know, just started playing around with different ideas. I trained jujitsu and also, again, a very like kind of male dominated white space. And I started to kind of tamper with the idea of like, well, maybe there's other women that are like me that want to see representation. And that was kind of like my first pitch of entrepreneurship with my e-commerce brand. But I kind of just started to think outside the box. And I started to recognize that my skill set as an engineer are so valuable, so transferable. And when people are looking to make a change, I think they fear like, I've already put in so many years into this. Like, what are people going to think if I like leave and do something just completely different right and I mean I felt all those fears I'm not even gonna lie like I a very long time I stayed in that job until one day I just had to calm myself out and be like I'm just burnt out I'm not happy and if there's any time to try something it's right now Mm. that is a whole word right there y'all like I think we spend so much time thinking about the sunken cost right like how much time have i dedicated how much money have i spent on degrees to get to this career and how many sacrifices have my family made for me to have these opportunities like there's so much baggage mm-hmm. and so i'm curious cuz i know i felt a lot of this like guilt it almost felt like i was betraying my family for choosing me versus what they wanted for me Did you have any hesitations around telling your family like, hey, guys, I'm going to quit my career as a rocket engineer to go be a salary negotiation coach? Yes, I actually didn't tell my mom for a bit because I was I'd already made the decision in my family, I'm the the oldest and kind of the one who has their like stuff together, you know, like the career and, and, you know, financial literacy. So when I told my mom, she was kind of like, well, you've always figured things out before. So Mm -hmm. I'm not really worried about you, but I was, <laughs> which was a nice, you know, response, but I yes. was like scared because there was no guarantee that this was going to work, you know, and, and I'm not going to lie. Like, I think like two weeks after I left my job, I had this like mental breakdown where I started crying and I was like, did I just make the dumbest mistake of my mm-hmm. life? Like, mm-hmm. you know, and it is especially first gen Latinas, like we are kind of the ones that are that first generation to like set things up for building wealth for our family. So it is kind of a big deal to leave such a secure, well-respected job for something that's kind of just, you don't know, you don't know. (laughs) (laughs) It's very much everything that our parents told us not to do, right? We're told not to take risks. Don't do the scary shit. Don't rock the boat. 
And I think it's also as women, we're just told to like, stay small, don't take up space, don't use your voice. So there's so many narratives that are telling us like, don't do the thing that you are called to do. And so fighting through all of those thoughts can be something really difficult for people. And I'd love to know what your journey was like. What did you actually do to start quieting those voices that could potentially stop you from doing what you were meant to do? That is a great question. And I love talking about this because it involves therapy. And I know it's something that not many of us grew up, you know, hearing that is okay. So I'm like full transparency. Therapy is a big thing that helped me. And specifically a couple of years ago, like my dad had passed away. And at the time I was just been diagnosed with PTSD. So I was like, it was just a lot going on in my life. And then my dad passed away. And luckily I had a therapist. So I was able to work through that grief through that trauma with someone. And I learned and picked up a lot of tools to help me with like questioning my limiting beliefs and really working through and saying like, is this true? Really? And when we think about like the things that hold us back, usually it's like some kind of fear, like, oh, I can't make more money, right? That's a limiting belief that money is hard to make. And then I go and I I ask myself, is that true? And then I start to create all these like, almost like evidence of like, how that's not true. So it's like, okay, that's not true. So we can let that go now and start to, I don't usually replace it with like a different, like an affirmation or something like, you know, I'm creative and I can monetize, I can easily monetize my ideas or something like affirming that really I can like actually believe now. But really it was, I would say therapy and also just questioning, especially with my dad passing, like really putting into question my own life and thinking, I am not guaranteed tomorrow. I'm not guaranteed next year. And if I'm going to be here, like on this earth, like what do I want to do? And at the time in, in 2018, I had no idea. I had no idea what it was, but you know, I just started to go after different things that I would have never thought of and found myself here a couple years later. So it's, it's been a, a long journey. And a lot of people, I think they might see other people's success and think like it was overnight or just one day they did it. It's been a long time in the making. So, yeah. It's been a lot of trial and error, y'all. So I think you should know that anybody that you see glowing up has been through a lot of challenges, a lot of struggle to get to where they are. So I'm curious because a lot of folks want to do this, right? This is why you joined my program. You want to find your side hustle. You want to find your thing. How did you center in on salary negotiation? Did you start getting like, questions from people about it? Or how did that come about? Yeah, so I started off initially actually talking about mental health and therapy and personal finance. And in 2020, I started to get very vulnerable with like my friends and my inner circle and saying like, let's put our debt on the table. Let's put our cards here. Let's be transparent. What are we making? How much debt we do we have? What is our student loans look like? And once I started seeing that, like I started to recognize that a lot of my friends who are happened to be women of color were being underpaid. And so I started with my inner circle. You know, I started negotiating probably like a couple of years ago and I really started to create like my process and like have a whole, you know, program on how I do that. But I started with my inner circle and my challenge was I want to make sure that they are getting equitable pay. So it really started with just helping my friends And then from there, realizing this is something that, you know, you read about it. 60% of women do not negotiate their salary ever. And then you you see like the pay gap and how it affects different groups of people, especially Latinas and Black Indigenous women. And when you you put those two things together, I started realizing that there is a whole community that is not served, who is not like going after these, you know, this money. And we're leaving money on the table because a lot of us just don't know. Right. And it's so multi-layered, but I initially started working with my friends and from there realizing, oh, I'm really good at this. Like maybe I can help other people and just kind of starting my group coaching program where I get to help people like tackle on like, like so many different elements of negotiating, but it's, it's been, you know, trial and error and working with my friends first myself and then my friends and realizing I want to impact more than just my friends. That is such, such a gem, y'all. I hope you heard that because it really doesn't have to be that you have everything perfect and figured out before you just decide to test the waters and see what you could potentially be good at. I think it's important to give ourselves permission to experiment and evolve 
because that's what you're meant to do as a human being. And it's no different when you're an entrepreneur. Okay, so we touched a little bit upon it, but I think it's important to really drive home the message about why it is so important, especially for women of color to negotiate their job offers, their client prices, whatever it is, when it comes to money, like we need to be doing this. Can you tell us why? Yes. So for kind of like what I mentioned, only 60% of women negotiate their salaries. And specifically, like when we're talking about Latinas, Latinas on average are missing out on $1.1 million over the course of their careers. And like you talk a lot about investing and different things, right? So when you think about $1.1 million compounded over time, heck, $1.1 million is, is transformational, right? So it's really not just that $1.1 million that we're missing out on. We're missing out on multi-million dollars. When you think about those two metrics together and just seeing it with my friends and seeing like how many of us were underpaid and I was underpaid at one point, right? And so I realized that this is affecting way more people than one initially thinks. And the problem is that every year we see like talk about the pay gap, equal pay, and all the messages around this conversation is ask for more, uh, know your worth. And the one that really gets me is just be confident. But the problem is that we are not underpaid just out of nowhere, right? Like the reason why a lot of like, there's this one quote that I love by Rachel Waters, and I know you love her book and it's, we should all be millionaires. And in it, she writes, women hold lower wages because we have been historically and systematically undervalued as a collective. And we have internalized a belief that our work is less valuable. So that is literally the byproduct of racial and gender biases. So it's not like I tell people all the time, don't feel bad about being underpaid because it's not your fault, right? Like if we grew up with different experiences, whether it's just dealing with sexism or racism and these things do in like we do internalize some of these like limiting beliefs that we like then carry on as adults and we're not responsible for our limiting beliefs, but we are responsible for changing them. And that's where it really comes into like, real, like, it's not even about like, I tell people all the time, you can go in with a perfect script, a perfect like, this is what I'm going to ask for. This is why. But if you don't believe it, your employer won't believe it. And that's why I, I tell people all the time, working on mindset is really the foundation for being able to go and advocate for yourself whether it's in salary negotiations, raising your prices with clients, or even selling a product, if you don't believe you add value, it's going to be hard to even ask for a monetary like amount. The thing that drives me nuts is the people who like will come in the comments and say like the pay gap, it's an imagination, it's fictitious, and it's just a way to play the race card, if you will, right? Even though there's like so much data to support mm -hmm. this. I, I wrote a piece for Synchrony Bank recently about why personal finance is different for Latinas. And so just so, some statistics, because I think there's folks that think that the reason why Latinas get paid less is because they tend to be in lower paying professions. The U.S. Census has data that shows that Latina nurses earn 27% less than white male nurses. So it's the exact same job, okay? It's not that they're comparing somebody who works, you know, so let's say a McDonald's to somebody who works on Wall Street, not what's happening here. And I think there's also this perception that somehow if we educate ourselves more, if we get more degrees, we'll naturally catch up. And that's actually not the case. Latinas that have a bachelor's degree earn 35% less than a white man with the same level of education. So it's really frustrating to me to hear the fact that people don't want to acknowledge that these systemic things exist. And I think it's just representative of like America and it's very individualistic culture that it's just like, if you're not doing well, it's your fault. We all have the same opportunities by your bootstraps, all that toxic ass narratives. We have to get away from this idea that there are not systemic things at play because there absolutely are. Absolutely. I get DMs from guys, Latinos, men, white men all the time about how it's not real, how like all the <laughs> data is, is not accurate because it doesn't include like women in higher positions or like different. And I'm like, no, homie, across the board, like there's data across the board, regardless of industry that like women in general, especially Latinas are getting underpaid. It is crazy. It is, it's, it is infuriating, too, because it's like, especially when it's your experience. Yeah. Right. Absolutely. It's like they're trying to gaslight your own experience. 
Yeah, it's very frustrating. And that's why it's so important that we have these discussions to really continue to normalize the idea that it is absolutely essential that you negotiate your salary. Like it should not be a, maybe I will, maybe like you must, because we can only be our strongest advocates. And I think as we collectively do that as a group of people, we can demand much more of not only the corporate space, but the government and policymakers and folks who can do the policy work that is required to really bridge these gaps. So let's talk about what are some of those questions that you should be asking when you're negotiating your salary? It can feel like there's so many things to think about. What are some of the key questions that you think folks should be asking? I think one thing is to look at every job differently. So if you're looking, you're applying for, let's say a new job, you want to see like how well your resume aligns with like a lot of the things that are on there. And also recognize that a lot of people like over ask, like they'll ask for like, you need 10 years of experience. And many times you don't, I think that I forget the data, the statistic for this, but like, you'll have like white men apply for these things that they don't necessarily like, they'll make three out of the 10 qualifications and they're applying where women are like, Oh, I only have eight out of the 10. So I'm not going to apply. So really, I think it's almost like a fear of like being told no, but like that no means nothing about you. It has nothing to do about like your value. Like I would say, shoot your shot, right? Go for it because other people are, and you're very well qualified. So that's one thing I would say. And then another is, I think a lot of the fear that people have around negotiating is like this fear of like, I'm afraid to look greedy or ungrateful. But the way I like to frame that, like that phrase is you are not greedy for asking, like for holding a boundary, for asking for what you deserve. That should be the the bare minimum, right? Asking for what you deserve, especially when it comes to negotiating salary. The base salary is obviously something that you can really optimize and maximize, but there's other things you can look at too. Like I love to tell people to look at what adds value to their life, like maybe flexibility in their schedules, what really allows them to, you know, pick up their kids from work or, you know, go to events or the gym, whatever adds value to your life. It's really understanding what makes you happy, what adds value and what kind of things can you negotiate? That might mean equity. That might mean flexible time. It might mean every other Friday off. It might mean tuition reimbursement. There really is like so many things outside of salary that can be negotiated. And I say get creative, you know, like think about what really you want, what adds value and just kind of get creative with it. The worst they can say is no. Absolutely. So I think a lot of folks tend to think of the salary negotiation conversation when they might be switching employers. Mm -hmm. But do you think that, Folks who want to stay at their company, but just maybe want to get paid more because they've done some market research and have figured out that they're being paid not what they should be. Do you think it's okay for current employees to also ask for a salary? And like, what would be your best tips for how to bring up that conversation? And is there a specific time of year that might be ideal? Yeah, I'd say absolutely. Like I tell everyone that they should negotiate every year. And so if you realize or think that you might be underpaid, you don't have to wait to have that conversation. That is something that you can go ahead and do. And I I highly recommend that people do. And then ideally, a lot of people like to negotiate around their annual review also to kind of like showcase and demonstrate how they've added value over the year. And a tip I have for that is to really document your wins, document your wins, because sometimes when we look back at what we've accomplished, we forget all the little things. And once you have a kind of a documented list of what you've done, quantify it. How much did you cutting out on that process? Did that save half a million dollars? Did that save a quarter million? Like really think about how much value you added by your leadership or by the projects that you initiated, because it's way easier to go to your employer and say, I did really well this year. I saved a quarter million dollars on, you know, being able to reduce this, this wasteful system. I'd like, you know, a $10,000 raise, whatever it is, right? Like it's almost a no brainer, right? And there's like, I tell people all the time, everyone should have a LinkedIn because sometimes you'll have recruiters reach out to you with like new opportunities, even if it's in a similar title. And that's a great way to kind of understand the current market value to say, oh man, this competitor is paying more than what I'm getting paid for now. Like you can take that information and say, hey, I have so-and-so approaching me. And their average salary is this. And, you know, that really aligns with me, but I really want to stay here. And I really, whatever 
you know, like reason you want to stay for your company, you can always have that conversation, especially when you know that other people are paying a different amount. You know, one of the questions that used to trip me up in my career when I was young was this question around, well, what are your salary requirements? I hate that job interview question because it's like they're putting you on the spot and they're forcing you to have that negotiation there. What's mm-hmm. your tip for how to deal with that question? I love this question because <laughs> I honestly think that like a lot of people say like you have to negotiate in person or on the phone because like you have more leverage. And sure, you might have more leverage in that situation, but ultimately do what makes you more comfortable. Like if you are more comfortable, like if you just really stress out about that question in the interview, it's better to say, I'd like some more time to think about it. Can I get back to you via email? Than it is to kind of like be nervous and scared and say a number that's like way undervalued. Like ideally you've done your research and you have a number, but I, I feel like it really is like know yourself and like know what you feel more confident doing and do that. I think that's way more impactful than being scared and, and, you know, saying a number that just doesn't align with you, but you felt pressure to like just answer on the spot. So you mentioned the word research, and I think folks can feel overwhelmed with like how to actually start doing that research for figuring out what is an appropriate number, because they don't necessarily want to go into an interview and say something and people are just like, are you fucking kidding me? Like, that's completely unrealistic. (laughs) So what is the best way for us to do that market research so that we have an accurate, you know, ballpark of where we should be? Yeah, there's definitely places like Glassdoor or Indeed that provide kind of like an idea of the salary range and market value. I'm a huge advocate for like talking to former coworkers and even coworkers that you might be comfortable having that conversation with to really see like what the kind of like reality of the salary is. That way you kind of feel like you have more agency and asking for an amount that's more aligned with you. And it's also a good way to see if you are being underpaid. So I think if we destigmatize that conversation, it really does allow us to have this conversation and can be more confident. One thing also that I tell people that is kind of like out of the norm, I guess, is understanding like, again, Rachel Rogers, she talked about comparison-based salary and like value-based salary. So value-based salary is when you think about like literally the value that you add And that's where like quantifying your, the way you add value, quantifying your projects and quantifying what you do. That's really a great way to assess like, oh, actually, like I know the market value is this, but I have like, I have more value than that and I can bring more to the table. And so I'm going to ask for a little bit more than that. And I think that's where kind of people start to like get nervous because you are kind of shooting higher for what people like maybe traditionally set out. For, but a good employer is going to see the value you bring and is going to say like, you know what, like, we don't want to pass up on this one. Like, I don't know how we're going to make that work, but let's see what we can do, you know? And I think a good employer is going to recognize that and have that conversation. That's really good advice. Okay. Another interview question that I hate so much is how much do you make in your current position? How do we deal with this question without pigeonholing ourselves again into replicating the same shitty salary we're trying to get away from? I honestly do not like this question either. And (laughs) I I think in some states, like I think like New York and and California, I forget which states, like that is not allowed. That's not a question that's allowed during the conversation. And I honestly just, I don't like to answer that question. I don't answer that question, actually. Like I'm not comfortable talking about that. Let's talk about this current one. This is the market value. And I'm not sure if that's like the right answer, but I just don't think that your future, like your next job or your next step should be dependent on your last role. Because if you were underpaid, you're just going to get continue to be underpaid. And that's not okay. I think sometimes you just got to get it good at like reshifting the nature of the conversation and just really saying something along the lines of like, well, this is a different position. It's going to require different responsibilities. So it doesn't make sense for me to answer that question. Mm -hmm. And, you know, it's really like you have to get really courageous. You have to just be okay with feeling terrified about the entire conversation because it's not an easy thing to do. Right. And so if you approach it with this sense that, yes, this is going to be scary. Yes, they could say no. Yes, I could end up getting an offer that is just not what I wanted. At the end of the day, you still have all the power in the situation, right? It's just really 
about you deciding, is this worth my time? Is this not? Am I going to keep looking? And that's okay. Like we're, we're not going to die. If somebody's like, no, I'm not going to pay you this though. So you're just going to go and look somewhere else until you find what you're looking for. Yeah, absolutely. And one thing that I love to tell people on that note is a no is really just like leading you to a different door where someone is going to say yes. And I think it's really important to remember that like, if we just make decisions out of fear, like we're not necessarily going to get the result that we want. And I know we're talking about salary negotiations, but this is true for like friendships and relationships. Like, you know, like we can't stay just because that's all we know or, and like, there is more out there for us. And it's really important to remind ourselves that like, of course, like I can totally like be with somebody who is going to treat me like the queen that I am. Like, that's not even like, what, why am I tripping? And it's the same for a job. Like, yeah, of course I'm going to find an employer that's going to like see me and be like, wow, she adds so much value. We need to bring her on our team. But we have to actually believe that in order to like not say yes to things that don't serve us. It's time that we really think about what serves us. And that's what we're saying yes to. Yeah, I really love that. I'm curious, like, what's the scariest thing you've ever personally negotiated for? And how did it go? That's a good question. (laughs) I would actually say that the first time I negotiated, it was probably the first the, the really scary part for me because it was just the first time. And at that point, I didn't know anyone that was negotiating. And I was kind of just like reading up on blogs. And I almost asked her like twice my salary. <laughs> and I got it. And that but like, yeah, I was but the thing was like, I was so scared because in my head, I was like, what I, you know, full transparency, my first job, I was severely underpaid. And I think mm-hmm. I was making $57,000 as an engineer. And in California, which is wild. So wild. Yeah. (laughs) And when I realized I was being underpaid, I was like really upset, mad. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to go and I'm going to like showcase like why I deserve more. I did this and my employer, my current employer, like gave me a tiny bump, like Mm -hmm. not even a grand, you know? Oh my God. It was, it was literally an insult. (laughs) And, but what it taught me was that. When we say yes to employers that already undervalue us, they're hoping and like forecasting to continue a low pay. Yeah. And so what, even though I obviously add a lot of value to them, they were like, we're not, we didn't sign up for that. Right. Mm -hmm. So I looked for a different role and I found a different role where I was going to take more of a senior position or more of a lead position. And I got courageous and I asked for almost twice that. (laughs) And I was so scared. I actually had a friend like kind of coach me through it and they were a white man and they were like, yeah, you should ask her like way more. And I'm like, what are you thinking? And they're like, like $50,000 more. <laughs> like what? That's insane. I'm like, that works for you. But like, no, that's like, I, I got offended that he gave me that, like that advice. I was like, are you kidding me? Like that's, I can't do that. Like that's, they're going to say no. And like, it took like a lot for them to like really help me. And I was like, you know what? Like I am being underpaid and <laughs> <laughs> let me just shoot my shot. And we vibed. And if it's crazy, maybe they'll just come down a little bit, but yeah. instead they actually gave me what I asked for. And then after that, I was like, you know what? I want to negotiate like a sign bonus and maybe like more PTO. And like, I was able to make something work with it. And it really made me like, see that like, Oh my gosh, like, I have this, like I have this ability <laughs> to ask for more. And it kind of almost became a game. Like, well, will they budge on giving me more vacation? Cause I love to travel and mm-hmm. you know, like, will they budge on like helping pay for maybe like a like lean certification? Like, what are they, like, what are they willing to help me? You know, like that is so freaking inspiring. Oh my God. Congratulations. That is so powerful. And I know a lot of folks are going to be inspired by that story. And it really just is about getting over the fear and doing it anyway. Yeah. Just imagine how different your life would be if you had not taken that risk. I honestly, that helped me so much with like paying off, like just debt and setting myself up for like my personal finances. And I had companies tell me no, which is like also like, scary and it's and real life it is real life no that, that's so powerful thank you for sharing that because i think folks they get scared of like what could go wrong but it's also just like what could go right y'all like imagine mm-hmm. 
<laughs> yeah. We spend so much time being so creative with all the things that could go wrong. Like literally, <laughs> when, when, even if we don't hear back from a friend, they're like, they're mad at me. They must have taken my story and just thought, you know, like we get so creative, you know, when it comes to like developing like what could go wrong. And it's like the same amount of energy it takes to think about the opposite of like what can go right. So you sent me a message on Instagram, I think it was last month, where you said that your business made more in that month than you had as an engineer. And for folks who are just like scared to negotiate, scared to ask for more, scared to walk away from a quote unquote stable job because they are afraid that there's no way that somebody's going to pay them as much as they want to make. There's no way they can make as much money in their business as they want to make. What would be your message to, to folks who think that? That's a great question. Just really like to say like life is very short. And I think because of like my father's passing, I really, that really put things in perspective. And for me, I have like a fear of like things staying the same especially when I was like unhappy in my job I was like is this life like is this it I show up and I work this hard and I'm not doing the things I want you know like traveling or like seeing cool experiences or I don't know that scared me a lot and when you allow yourself to really just like go after what you want it's like almost like a domino effect it starts with one little thing and then you realize oh my god it went really well and then you kind of just keeps going and then you start to realize like when I actually go after the things I want, like the universe has my back, especially like when I made that switch of like letting go of my job, which I didn't like plan to do. It kind of just happened. Like my goal was like three years in this role, I'll like be set and then I can, you know, head out. And instead, like, I just, I just didn't have it in me anymore to like show up. Allowing myself to like fully commit to my business. I really started to see like how just good I am at figuring things out and how passionate I was about these two things. And that when I actually put 40 plus hours or 40 hours a week into my side hustle, not a side hustle, my business, right? Like it actually did really well. Like we spend so much time putting energy and our resources and skills into employers. But if you were to do that for your own business, it's crazy what you can accomplish. And it's hard to do. Like, I'm like so amazed that you were able to build your business, like pretty much on the side. Cause like, that is just incredible. Like I couldn't do it, <laughs> but yeah, I think like really just allow yourself to like, almost like give yourself permission to just try failure is not failure. I think, you know what I mean? Like it's always a lesson. It's always a lesson. And I think we fear failure so much. We fear so much of what people have to say about us. But like, they're not paying the bills. They're not like, you know, it really is like, this is your life. Like, this is the only one you have, like, you know, so it's, it's the only one y'all like for real, yeah. we don't get do overs. You don't get a second chance to, you know, unless you believe in reincarnation, it's fine, whatever. But I think that message is so important because I also realized once I gave myself permission to be a full-time entrepreneur, shit started changing. The energy in the room started changing. The energy I would accept from other people started changing. And I was actually like expanded my capacity to receive because I was not giving so much of my energy to something that I didn't care about anymore. Right. It's very difficult to be the best version of yourself when you are giving so much away to things, to people, to jobs who don't give a fuck and who don't light you up and who don't make you feel like you're living in your purpose. So I would invite anybody who's listening to this that has had some thought about like, I need to make a change, whether that is a job, whether that is your living environment, whatever, something is telling you that shit's got to go. Start listening. Stop trying to justify it away. Stop trying to say, oh, I'm crazy for wanting this. I'm crazy for having these different ambitions, these different goals. I should just be happy with what I have. No, you should not stop until you are happy genuinely, not because of what other people think about what you've achieved, but because you have listened to yourself and trusted yourself to live the life that you want. That's it. Absolutely. And I think I'm sure you've like experienced this too, but like realizing how much impact you can make that you are making, it's almost like 
for me, that's like the big, even those little DMs or emails or anything that are like, Hey, like I saw your, your blog on this and I went and I negotiated like five figures and increase. Like when I get those messages from people, it's just like, I want to cry because I'm just like, yes, yes. Like you're Imagine amazing. if you had never showed up doing what you do, what ripple effect that you're having just by being you. And that's, what's crazy is that like being you is like what makes your business so good. <laughs> <laughs> It's true. We have so many gifts to share with the world. And if we are going to share them, we should be getting paid adequately. And we should be not afraid to ask for what we deserve. So Evie, I love this conversation. I hope folks are inspired to advocate for themselves and to make 2022 the year that like, they are done being afraid of asking for what they deserve. So for folks that want to find out more about you, follow your journey, work with you, join your group coaching program, where's the best place for us to find you? Yeah, the best place to find me is on Instagram at La Mala Mujer blog. I'm always sharing like stories and just content and tips, like always having new people on the IG live talk about like just different strategies. And it's even the mindset, the mindset part of it. But yeah, that's a great place to find me. And if you're interested in more like tips, I have a newsletter that I love sharing just my journey and then just things that have helped me. So yeah, amazing. I have no words to describe how I have literally watched you blossom from somebody who is just trying to figure out what is it that they're meant to do. Like, girl, you are flourishing. I am so here for it. I am so excited for folks to listen to this episode and to start putting the things that you have given us into play. And I just encourage you, like, keep going because you are just at the beginning of the amazing impact that you're going to have in our community. So Thank you so much for what you do. No, and thank you so much for having this platform because girl, you're the reason I'm even here. You know, <laughs> let's be real. You know, like just seeing you, your first couple, like your first couple of recordings where you're just talking to yourself and hyping yourself up. I felt that girl. <laughs> I felt that. I started at episode one, girl. Oh man. I love it. Oh my gosh. Thank you so much. It's an honor. No, thank you. Thanks for listening to today's episode. If you are ready to take your dinero to the next level, sign up for our free 14-page guide, The Financially Lit Latina, the ultimate blueprint for becoming poderosa with your dinero. This 14-page guide includes our best tips on money mindset, budgeting, debt repayment, career, investing, financial independence, side hustles, and more. And you can get it completely free. So to get your copy of the Financially Lit Latina, just head over to YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com slash start. That's YoQuieroDineroPodcast.com slash start and start transforming your dinero story today. Until next time, stay empowered, stay inspired, and stay poderosa. On the Yo Quiero Dinero podcast and associated entities, all information provided is for general information purposes only and does not constitute accounting, legal tax, or other professional advice. Listeners should not act upon the content or information found here without first seeking appropriate advice from an accountant, financial planner, lawyer, or other professional. We assume no responsibility for information contained on this podcast and associated entities and disclaim all liability with respect to such information, including but not limited to any liability for errors, inaccuracies, omissions, or misleading or defamatory statements. Usage of this podcast and associated contents constitutes an explicit understanding and acceptance of the terms of this disclaimer.